Good evening and welcome to New Milton Baptist Church as we gather this evening in our homes through the internet via CD to worship God together. Hear some words from the prophet Isaiah, a prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will deny, delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in the name of Jesus, the one who is that shoot from the stump of Jesse, that one who, humanly speaking, was of the house of David, but that one who was and is God made flesh, fully God, and fully man. And we come in his name, the one who was the sacrifice for our sins, to worship you tonight. Father, we ask that you will give us the grace to worship, to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit, that we might be drawn into your presence, that we might perceive you with our hearts and be drawn to worship. We ask that you, by your Spirit, would speak into our lives, that your word would be living and active for us tonight, that we might meet with you, worship you, and be transformed, that we might become what we can be in you. Yet, Father, even as I say that, so we recognise that we've thought, said and done things that have fallen short of your standards. We've sinned in thought, in word and in deed. And so as we come, we come confessing our sins. Yet even as, even as we confess, so we know the reality of your promise, that the blood of Jesus, your Son, cleanses us from all sin. So receive our thanks. Receive our worship, we pray, through Jesus. Amen. Now, in the evenings, we'll, we're, back, we're looking again at the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. So if you'd like to find in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 6, and I'll be reading verses 10 through to 20. Now, you might like to keep your, your, uh, your Bible open at this page. So reading from verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. 
and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the Gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and we ask that you'll burn it deep into our hearts tonight. Please enable me to, to speak it, to, to, to interpret it, to open it up. And by your spirit, convict us, convince us, do a work in our lives, we pray, that we might be pleasing to you in every way. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Ephesians is a wonderful letter. It's a letter of encouragement, a letter with some wonderful guidance on Christian living. Well, in the last few months, we've looked at right living, we've looked at walking the way of love, we've looked at right relationships, and now we're looking at how we can maintain them. The armour of God that we find in Ephesians 6 is not a separate section for those engaged in serious spiritual warfare. This is a continuation of Paul's exhortation to Christian living. We looked at this last time. Put on the full armour of God. Why? That you may be able to stand your ground that you might remain stable and after you've done everything that you've got to do to stand, to remain upright on your feet not flat on your back. God has given us this armour to help us to live, to serve him, to live victoriously and to remain stable. And today we come to verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Well, this is the first item in God's panoply, his armour and weapons, the belt of truth. And verse 14 reads literally, Stand firm therefore, girding around the loins of you with truth. Well, the literal translation is somewhat more earthy than the sanitised version that we have in the NIV. The call is to stand firm, girding our loins with truth. And seeing how earthy the literal rendering is, actually in my view makes it much clearer. A person's loins are the place where a girdle is worn. The loins are the most vulnerable part of the body, the place where the reproductive organs are. The loins have been the downfall of many an unwary Christian. Well, this is an unpalatable truth. The loins can be seen as the source of the desires of the flesh, the most sensitive secret area of our personalities. And almost everything, on, on almost everything but Channel 4, the loins are kept well out of sight, under cover with modesty preserved. And here, it must be said that loins doesn't just refer to sexual matters. The flesh is concerned with our base nature. Not just sexual lust, but greed, greed for money, lust for power, desire for significance, pride. Those desires that motivate us those desires that in themselves might not, might not actually be evil, but when they control us, when we allow them to run riot, they become idols, leading us away from God. When the flesh is dominant, sin is in prospect. The desires of the flesh are actually fundamentally selfish, they're self-centred, and they're the root of all kinds of sin. Sexual lust has been the root of adultery and all manner of sexual impropriety that's brought Christian leaders down. Pride 
and the lust for power has been the cause of division and the ruin of many churches. And these desires lie hidden in the loins, in the deepest secret places of our personalities. These are the desires that we keep hidden, often even from ourselves. We deny the reality and the power of them, and in doing so, we don't take precautions. We leave ourselves open to all sorts of temptations, which if not taken seriously, can lead to our ruin, as they have done for so many apparently upright Christians. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is so much more to this world than what we see with our eyes. We are spiritual beings. We're created in God's image. But God is not the only spirit who is at work in the world. God is God. He's almighty. He's holy. He's the creator of all things. He's the one who holds all things together by his all-powerful word. He is God, the only God, and there is no other. But there are myriads of angels, messengers and servants of God who are active in the world. There are myriads of angels, both good and holy, and fallen and evil, and malevolent. The devil is very much real. We only have to look at what's going on in the world to see that evil is an intelligent thing. The devil is a fallen angel. He's mighty, but he's not God. He's powerful, but he's not almighty. He's powerful, but he's not omnipresent. Once he worshipped God and served him but then he chose to go his own way. He rebelled against the almighty God and filled with pride, he became foolish. He's winsome and deceptive. And when he fell, he took a third of the angels in heaven with him. You can find that in Revelation 12. And these are the demons, the unclean spirits in aggressive rebellion against God. They can't attack him because he's God. So they attack and seek to ruin all that God loves. And God loves humanity. Tempting and deceiving, they seek to lead us away from the God who loves us. Filled with hate, they seek to steal, kill and destroy. And of the devil, Jesus said, he was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. In rebellion against God, his main weapon is temptation. Human beings created in God's image have freedom to choose how we act. He was present in the garden in the beginning, tempting our first ancestors to sin, lying to them, lying, deceiving. And when they gave in to the temptation, they were ruined. They fell, they rebelled. Human sin has polluted and ruined the world. Human sin has polluted and ruined the human race. We're fallen, we're spoiled. As a race, we're unclean. Our sin, the fact that we're not perfect, has cut us off from the God who created us to love him. He loves us, but sin is abhorrent to him. God cannot tolerate sin by nature. 
the Ten Commandments, the law of God, stands to show us that we can't make it on our own. We sin, we break the commandments. God's law sh that shows us how to live, how to live in harmony with God and with one another. And those same commandments become a charge sheet against us, highlighting our guilt, the laws that we've broken. But wonderfully, God has dealt with the problem of sin once and for all. He loves us and doesn't want anyone to perish. He loves us and in Jesus, God made flesh. He's dealt with, the, with our sin himself. Jesus was and is God. In him, all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. Jesus lived the perfect life, a life without sin. And then he died for our sin on the cross. He died for us. His death is our salvation. Through the cross, he forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, the list of commands that we've broken, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. God himself has dealt with the problem of our sin. He's made forgiveness and reconciliation with him possible. He invites all of us to come to him, to believe, to commit ourselves to him, and so receive his forgiveness. He invites us to turn our backs on sin, to return to him, be born again and start afresh. Such is his love. And before a person comes to Christ, the devil and his angels will do all they can to keep us in the dark, to keep us away from Jesus, blinded to the truth. But when a person comes to Jesus, when we receive God's forgiveness, when we're reconciled to him, accepted and adopted as children of God, then he becomes our mortal enemy. The devil and his angels will do all they can to unseat us, to make us unproductive, to ruin our witness, to wreck our walk with God. And the way they operate is through temptation, speaking lies into, into our minds, leading us to do things that, that we shouldn't. And when we sin, when we give in to it, we feel, we feel guilt. They operate through guilt. They lead us into sin and then debilitate us with guilt. And this is where we return to our loins. The enemy, the devil, will use our natural desires, our flesh, our base nature to tempt us, to lead us into sin. And it's, our, and it's in our loins in those desires that are deepest, our secret weaknesses, these are the easiest for them to exploit. It's those most sensitive areas that are the easiest and most effective inroads for the devil and his angels. Those things we wouldn't want anyone else to see, those desires we want to keep hidden, our lusts and greeds, our personal annoyances and pride, that which would motivate our flesh. The loins are the weakest point in the body. So Paul urges us to put on the belt of truth, literally, to gird around, to protect our loins with truth. To guard our most sensitive secret areas with truth. And that's the best protection. The best way to stop the dark side exploiting our weaknesses. Well, truth is a nebulous concept. So here it would be useful to understand what Paul means by truth. And the Greek word he uses, aletheia, has two main meanings, and both are very useful in keeping ourselves standing, in protecting our loins, our most secret heart and desires. Well, the first meaning of truth in this instance, 
is the quality of being in accord with what is true. I'll repeat that. The quality of being in accord with what is true. To put it more simply, it's truthfulness, dependability, uprightness. We gird our loins with truth as we're truthful about them. We do not seek to conceal our weaknesses. We face up to them. We're honest with ourselves. And a good way of doing this is having someone to be accountable to. Now we don't need to confess our sins to a priest to be forgiven. In John's first letter, we're told to confess them to God. We don't need another intermediary. But James urges us in his letter, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. This isn't confession to be forgiven, it's confession to be accountable, to take our weaknesses seriously, to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens. We live in accordance with the truth. We don't deceive ourselves and that way we don't fall. The second meaning of the word that Paul uses here that's translated as truth is the content of what is true, the truth itself. And in this context, the truth is the word of God. We gird our loins with the truth. We're careful to live according to the word. And the way we do that starts by reading it. How else can we understand what sin is? How else can we, can we know how to live? How else can we learn to avoid temptation? The Bible, the Word of God, is living and active. It's supernatural. This isn't just words. This is the very breath of God. As we read it, as we engage with it, it actually transforms us. The Bible is God-breathed, the very breath of God. And when a Christian engages with it, the Spirit of God applies it and breathes it into us. It gets to the heart of the matter. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. As we read and engage with the Bible, God speaks into our lives. Now it's been said that we do not study the Bible, rather the Bible studies us. And as we engage with it, he holds it up against our lives as a standard. It exposes our failings and our weaknesses, but not to condemn us, not for us to feel guilt, rather to transform us. As we see where we fall short, so we pray. We share with someone, and it's really good to have a soul friend, someone faithful, someone godly, someone who'll speak the truth to us, not what we want to hear, but the truth. Someone that we can, we can use to hold ourselves accountable. And as the word exposes, so we seek help. We pray, we feed on the word, and in time, the spirit will transform us controlling our desires, guarding our weaknesses, enabling us to live lives that please God. As we get to know and understand and apply the truth, the word of God, so his spirit helps us to live in accordance with the truth, giving us strength, transforming us, helping us to realise the, the, the new creation that we become when we first believe, when we're born again. The belt of truth Girding our loins with truth is a vital exercise, a vital piece of equipment that will help us to live. It's the first piece of armour that Paul names, and it's the basis of the rest, living in accordance with the truth. All the other pieces of armour have to be put on in truth, over the truth. We dare not have an unguarded place, a secret, hidden weakness that's not girded with the truth. If we do, then we're more likely to fall. 
we're more likely to end up flat on our faces. My dear friends, each item of the whole armour of God is vital to our Christian walk, to our daily living. And the one we need to put on first is the belt of truth, girding our most vulnerable parts with truth, protecting, guarding, not allowing the devil and his angels to get a foothold. There are times that we will fall, we're human, but if we take this seriously, we'll get better at it. We'll learn to stand, and having done all, to remain standing at the end. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word which challenges us. Grant that we might, in truth, put on the belt of truth who might gird our loins, the most sensitive parts of our nature, with truth. Father, grant us that, that we might learn to stand, that we might stand firm and become the people you desire us to be. And Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm afraid actually reading this quite a few times in the next few weeks. This is, the, this is the perfect hymn to read. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armour on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son, strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued and take to arm you for the fight the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. From strength to strength go on, wrestle and fight and pray. Tread all the powers of darkness down, and win the well-fought day. That having all things done, and all your conflicts past, ye may all come through Christ alone, and stand complete at the last. Now, let's, let's bring our prayers for others. Let's pray. Father God, as we come, so we bring to you the needs of this world. And Father, we pray first for the needs of our country, as we're having to live under strict restrictions because of this pandemic. So Father, we pray that these restrictions might be effective, that they might prevent the spread of the COVID virus, that we might see it begin to disperse and depart. We pray for all those who are having inoculations, and we ask that the vaccines might work that Father, people might be vaccinated and the vaccine work before catching this disease. That they might come through it alive and well and strong. Father, we pray for our police who are required to enforce these restrictions. And Father, we pray for them that they might act rightly and justly, but also mercifully. We pray for all those people who are present and not taking the, taking the matter seriously. We ask, Father, that you bring them to repentance, that they might respect the law and act in accordance with all that we're required to. We pray for the mental health of our nation, for all those who are alone, for all those who are feeling the weight the lockdown, the restrictions, and the pandemic around us. And Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts for our mental health. We pray that each of us might see where someone's struggling, that we might pick up the phone and encourage. We pray that you'll protect all those who've bubbled 
the sake of their mental health, that in their bubbles they might be kept safe. And Father, we pray, especially for the children and people who are off school, who can't attend during this lockdown. And we pray most of all for their mental health, that they might come out of this undamaged. We pray for all those who are struggling with poverty at this time, those for whom things are a struggle, that there isn't enough food. And Father, we pray that you would, give, you would give us open hands and open wallets, that we might give to the food banks, that there might be enough to go round, that people might not fall through the net. And Father, at this time we pray for our government. We pray that you would uphold it, that you would cause them to enact laws that are righteous and holy, that you would cause them to govern in accordance with your will, for they're not just accountable to the electorate. In all their governance, they're accountable to you, our creator, and the one who is the King of Kings. We pray for our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. We ask that you grant him wisdom and the ability to govern. We pray for the opposition and the media, that they might not just attack for attacking's sake, that they might not just seek to score cheap political points, but we pray that they all might work together for the good of all. And Father, we pray for our Queen. We thank you for our Head of State, one who is an unashamed Christian. And Father, we ask that you will guard and uphold her, that you would increase her years and give her the strength and the wisdom to advise, to warn and to encourage her ministers and the Prime Minister in particular. Father, we pray for the people of our town, the town in which this church is placed, asking that you would protect, that we might see this virus not take hold here. We pray for for all the old people in this town, as this is a retirement area, we ask that you protect and keep them, that none would fall through the net. And Father, we pray for this church, ask that you would breathe new life into us, that at this necessary time, we might bear witness to you, that others might hear about Jesus and find the hope that we have in him. And now, Father, we bring to you our own prayers, and we bring them to you in the silence. Now, Father, we bring to you all our prayers, the spoken and the unspoken, knowing that you've heard us, because we pray in that precious name of Jesus. And so we bring our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now hear the words of the blessing. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest with you this week. Amen. And God bless you.